Yeah, the way we have this planned out is uh, you know, I'll do like 30 minutes, talk about the uh, drill, the, the project, the motivation, and then the, the technology. And then we'll have Bruce here just de do, a, do a demonstration and, and show you what it, what it means to kind of use drill and what are some of the unique characteristics of the, of the project. So you know, it is an open source project. You can go download it you know, right after today or whenever you want, and I'll, I'll talk more about how to, how to do that. So, you know, what is, what is motivating us here to, to, to go and invest and, and do this, this whole project here is that data doubling in size, right, every, every two years, right? So the, the landscape of the amount of data that people are capturing and, you know, a lot of use cases around kind of marketing and, you know, people don't buy uh, ads in the local newspaper anymore. They're looking for things that are much more data driven, right? So that, you know, marketing, security, uh, use cases like that involve a lot of data. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of research, I'm sure many of you have read about that, and, you know, MapR as a, as a Hadoop distribution, we're kind of uh, very, very focused on that, uh, this whole area of big data, and how do you capture, store, and, and process all this, uh, all this data. One interesting thing to, to consider here, and, and this is driving, uh, one of the things that's driving this, uh, th this need here, is that the growth in data is really coming, yeah, some of it is coming from kind of structured data, things that you would you know, normally put in a relational database, uh, but just today, I was talking to one of our one of our customers, and they have a single table that has 24 terabytes of data in it. And uh, you know, you can see that's kind of structured, right? It has you know some some number of columns to it, uh, but it's not the typical uh, kind of relational model where you have you know tens of uh, or dozens or hundreds of tables that are uh, referring to each other, and, and you have to to construct one object, you have to you know do a, a join of uh, you know 20 different tables, right? So. Um, that's what we mean by uh, unstructured data. We're not, not talking about emails necessarily or you know, web pages or things that are just pure text, although that, that could also be the, the case. So this is kind of the, what we typically see now in terms of what data people are taking advantage of. So it could be click streams, uh, sensors, a lot of social media, uh, a lot of data that's coming from mobile devices, so that's now very uh, popular, lots of apps uh, that are taking advantage of this mobile data and that eventually gets fed into these uh, back-end systems that are being used for, uh, for analyzing that data or building uh, better recommendation engines, uh, doing anomaly detection, uh, things like that. And uh, you know, one of the, if you look at the history of, uh, of Hadoop and uh, where it kind of started, it started with this uh, paradigm of MapReduce. And the way that works is that the developer comes and they build a, uh, a MapReduce job. And uh, that could be basically the business user, uh, a developer, or, uh, or an analyst. And they need to get all this code done. So they have to, what I'm calling here, plumbing development. They have to write all this code just to do basic things like uh, read, the, read the file, uh, parse the, the data format, and join two tables. So they're doing a lot of plumbing development that doesn't really tie to the business case, right? And a lot of times this is a, in a large organization, this is typically a different person. So you know, the, the business user is going to IT and asking IT to build this, uh, build this for them just in order, in order for them to be able to access that data. And so that's really, really hard and uh, often delays the time it takes to build the app or to get the, uh, the, the insight or, or, or whatever. And so, you know, as the Hadoop community, what we did is we introduced these new systems like Hive and other SQL and Hadoop projects. And they, the goal there was really to make it easier to deal with the data. So instead of having to write all this custom Java code just to do something very simple with the data, you know, we'd expose a standard SQL interface. And with that standard SQL interface, you could do a lot of things uh, very easily by writing a single query. Now, the problem here is that we didn't really close this, this, uh, this gap by a lot because you're still relying on somebody to go model this data and ETL that data into some format that this engine, this SQL engine, can, can uh, consume, right? Somebody has to go and define and say, well, this file has these 10 columns and these are the data types. <coughs> And you know, if a new data, if a new column is added, you got to update that schema. Uh, and so there's still this this whole task of uh, modeling the data and transforming it. And both of these things really are requiring this 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 middleman, right? In a, in a larger organization, there's an IT department, right? If it's not you know a small startup, there's an IT department, and typically you know the end user is going to the IT department, filing a ticket, waiting oftentimes you know three months in order to, to get this to happen, so they can actually finally do something with that data. Now this may seem simple if you have one or two or five tables, but in a lot of these, uh, these applications and these real world scenarios, people have hundreds of tables or thousands of tables, and it's really, really complex. So it's not like you know, there's you know, all, all our data set is coming from some uh, single REST API and that, that's it, right? It's coming from all these tables, all these online APIs that data is coming in from. 
some of these are changing outside of our control as a, as a company, right? So some of them, you know, we're getting from some API and that API adds another field tomorrow and you know, that breaks. So that's, that's maybe this table here. And so it becomes really, really complex to, uh, to deal with this situation. And we hear this, uh, you know, we hear this all the time. So you know, one of the Fortune 100 companies here in the, in the Valley, actually, I was talking to their CIO and she was saying that you know, they just can't continue to manage data the, the old way by throwing it at the DBAs and then waiting a long time for it to become available. It was just, that was, you know, when we asked her what's the biggest challenge in IT, all of IT, that was her answer. It was basically, this was the, the, the hardest problem they had. Um, you know, we're hearing this, this, this all the time, just the existing processes and the existing systems where you have to really structure the data before you can do anything with it and are beginning to be a problem with the new volume, the amounts of data we have now and the types of data, the, the shape of the data that we have, uh, we have now. And so what, are we, what do we really want is we want this uh, uh, kind of holy grail of data agility. We want the end user to be able to access the data right away. So if I've been able to capture some file, whether it's a JSON file for some uh, online data set, or it's uh, something coming from an API, or it's from one of my internal systems, I want that to land in Hadoop or, or wherever, whatever I'm using and be able to query that data right away, right? And, uh, and so that's really what, uh, what we're after here. And if you think about it, the, uh, you know, the, the ideal scenario for, for somebody who's trying to do something with data is to have data that's perfectly structured, right? So you know, if we could uh, live in an ideal world, all the data would be very much structured. And, you know, we think about how we managed our own personal emails 10 years ago. You know, emails would come in and we put them in, or at least I would, I'd put them in folders and I have all these hierarchies of folders, you know, current project, uh, last year, uh, work, personal, all these different folders and every email that came in I'd, I'd organize. And today I have probably 20,000 emails in my inbox and, you know, I just use search to find them, right? So I'm not structuring things in advance, but I've been given the tools to find what I need, right, in, in this kind of mess. So. If we can improve the distance to the data and enable the end user to access the data directly, you know, it gives us two advantages. One is we improve time to value, so you know, they don't have to wait those three months for IT to, to get the data ready. Um, much more rapid data exploration and application development. Um, and then IT can provide value and, and kind of get out of the way, right? And, uh, and be more appreciated as a result of that. And it also reduces the burden on IT. So IT isn't interested in doing things that don't really add value. And so this lets you know the DBAs focus on the things that matter and not try to uh, you know deal with with problems that they're never going to be able to, to uh, get a hold of. So what is Apache Drill? Really, the idea here is to pioneer data agility uh, for Hadoop. It's uh, an Apache open source project, so it's uh, developed under the Apache Software Foundation, which means anyone can contribute to it, anyone can uh, download it, run it. Um, without paying anyone. And it's a scale out execution engine for low latency queries. So you would run it on anything from your, your laptop all the way up to a cluster of, uh, you know, our largest customer runs, uh, uh, not Apache Drill, but runs uh, you know, over 2,000 nodes. So very large clusters uh, um, that people run. So the idea is to be able to scale to those types of uh, sizes, but also be very easy for developers or for data scientists to, uh, to get started. Uh, and then also, you know, the initial focus here is uh, on uh, SQL queries for analytics, but eventually move into also operational apps and kind of provide that full spectrum of, uh, of use cases. And a lot of people are already contributing to the project from different organizations in addition to, uh, in addition to MapR, so that includes, uh, you know, companies like Cisco and LinkedIn and um, universities, et cetera, and really a lot of uh, database uh, ex expertise. So that's, that's kind of the, uh, what, what we're building here. And so how, how, you know, how are we evolving, uh, or how did we evolve to this point where you know, we're getting to kind of self-service data exploration, where the end user can just go uh, ask questions on the data without uh, having IT involved and having IT prepare the data. Um, so if you look at you know, 10 or 15 years ago, everything looked like this. You had the data visualization, which was very IT driven. If you wanted a new BI report, you'd go to IT and say, I want this IT report, and they'd spend you know, a bunch of time gathering requirements and eventually producing that report. And of course, IT would also be responsible for, uh, for delivering the backend, so creating the, the data warehouse, loading the data in there, creating the data models, et cetera. So IT was kind of responsible for all of this. And then you had BI companies like, uh, like Tableau, for example, come and say, you know, we can make that BI layer much more self-service. So the end user can create their own visualizations, their own dashboards, 
Um, any analyst can do that and not have to rely on IT for that. And IT can focus on the back end, creating the data warehouse or the database and loading the data in there and doing all the modeling and, and transformations, etc. SQL and Hadoop came along once we had we had Hadoop and really didn't change a lot of that. And you know, the data modeling transformations still have to happen, very IT driven. And, but you can still use these same self-service uh, data, visualization, data visualization capabilities. And then there's a new, new breed of uh, BI tools also that are kind of focused on specifically on big data on Hadoop. And the goal here with, uh, with Apache Drill and self-service data exploration is to change this and to also make this, uh, this backend component uh, very self-service. So you know, if IT stands up this Hadoop environment, as an end user, you can import whatever data set you want uh, from wherever you want and immediately uh, immediately go after that data, right? And that could be data coming in from other internal systems or from you know, other online APIs or other NoSQL databases, whatever it is, you, know, you should be able to query that immediately. Now this also enables zero day, uh, zero day analytics, which is you know, being able to analyze new data as it's come in and, and get timely uh, kind of insights. Okay, so what are the three uh, the three things that enable us to uh, to accomplish this? So the first one is that self-describing data is ubiquitous. So if you look today at uh, most uh, Hadoop environments or most uh, you know big data environments, uh, what you'll find is that data that's stored, whether it's in flat files or in NoSQL uh, databases or data stores, is self-describing in nature. Right. So if the data is in a uh, a format like Thrift or Avro or Google Protocol buffers, that means that there's a schema already there with the data, right? So um, you know, if you look at that file and the associated, some of them, the schema's embedded, some it's in a, a file next to the main file, but the schema's already there, right? Um, other formats like uh, Parquet and ORC that are columnar formats also have schema information embedded with the data. If you look at a JSON file, basically a file that has a bunch of JSON records, you know, one after the other, the schema information is in there, right? You can see the column names or the field names, uh, as we would call uh -huh. them in JSON, are actually in that file already, right? So you can look at that and, and see what the, you know, that this field is a name and this one's an age, uh, et cetera. Uh, and data types as well. So it doesn't have a ton of data types, but it does have data types, right? There's integers, there's strings, uh, there's dates. So, uh, and then finally traditional files, even CSV files have a header row that uh, typically has the column names there. And then, when you look at data stored in NoSQL stores, you know whether it's uh, you know relational or kind of sparse data in, in these uh, kind of key value data stores, all these different uh, uh, databases are self-describing. If you look at a table there, yeah, it describes the data. So ideally, when we look at a query engine that's going to run uh, in the Hadoop land, we don't want to require uh, the administrator or the user to go and define a schema for this data. You know, somewhere else in some centralized repository, because that data already comes with its schema, right? It's already self. That's what I mean by self-describing, right? So in this example here of you know a JSON file, you can see that it's self-describing. There's a name here, and there's a first and last under that, and some maybe arrays. So the data can be complex. It's not necessarily a flat record, um, but it is self-describing. If you look at this, you can actually understand what that what that data is. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is if you look at the different types of data that are out there, you could kind of organize them in this, this type of two by two uh, matrix, right? On the top, there's uh, what's, uh, what, what data has a fixed schema and what, has a, uh, what data doesn't have a schema at all, uh, meaning you know, every record could actually have different fields. And then what's flat and what's complex. And when I say complex, I mean things like nested, uh, having arrays, uh, et cetera, right? So most data that we see can be classified into one of these kind of four, uh, four buckets, right? So the, the typical relational model fits here on the top left. So it's flat and there's a fixed schema. And you know, if we're talking about files, a CSV would be in this category. You know, a MySQL or an Oracle table would, would fall under that category. A system like HBase would fall in this category, right? So you don't, don't really have nesting and you don't have arrays. But the data schema is so every record in your HBase table could actually have totally different field names. Uh, you know, you can call them columns, but it's not really columns at this point. It's it's more of a map. Um, and then you have formats like Parquet and Avro that they do have a fixed schema. The, the the schema is defined, but it does allow for nesting and it does allow for you know arrays and uh, or repeated values. And then finally, the the most complex is is this here, or the most flexible is kind of JSON or BSON, you know, X 
XML is another example of that, where each record in that data set could have completely different fields and it could be pretty complex. It could be nested, it could be have repeating or, or arrays in there, things like that. And one you know, important observation here is that all three of these uh, squares here can be represented as JSON logically, right? So you can logically look at a relational table and represent that as a JSON, right? Um, same thing as this, you can take an HBase table and represent that as JSON. You can represent a Parquet and Avra file as JSON uh, logically, right? I mean, there's a lot of optimizations from a performance standpoint, but all of those fit there. And so every other, prior to Apache Drill, every other SQL engine that's ever been built use the world like this here, right? As a flat table that has, you know, columns and rows and a fixed schema, right? That, that's kind of how every database, even SQL and Hadoop solutions have been built. And, you know, it's easier to build it that way, but it's also limiting because anytime you have data that's in one of these other more flexible formats, you actually have to uh, convert that data into something like this, right? You have to identify what's the schema, and a lot of times you have to ETL the data and transform it into something that looks like this so that the SQL engine can query it. So ideally, what we want to have is a SQL engine uh, that has all the power of SQL, things like joins and nested, you know, uh, nested queries and things like that, but at the same time, use a table like this as opposed to you know, what's at the top left. So being able to take a data set that looks like this and run a query that says, you know, select all the records that have name.first equals Michael and uh, you know has a count of hobbies as one or something like that you know you should be able to do that even though you know different records here as you can see you know this one has a district and this one has a you know this one instead of district right so that should be okay and this the engine should be built to, to handle that right and then finally you know being able to support schema discovery on the fly so when we talk about how do we how do we tackle schema and knowing or not knowing the schema in advance there's kind of a spectrum here where all other systems that have been, been built before require the schema to be known to the query engine before the query ran, right? So whether the, whether the schema was known before you loaded the data, which is what happens in a relational database like Oracle or MySQL or Teradata, right? You know that you have to define the schema as a DBA before you actually load the data. Or in Hadoop, what you do with Hive or, or you know, Impala or other SQL and Hadoop solutions is you can load data into Hadoop, but before you run the query, you have to map a schema onto that data. You have to tell Hadoop in this system called Hive Meta Store what, what the schema is. And both of these involve having a schema before the query actually runs. What we want to be able to do here is what we call schema on the fly. So be able to run a query where we actually don't know what that schema is in advance, and maybe there is no schema. Maybe we're gonna have different records, and over time, maybe the, the structure of this, uh, this record has evolved. And that is perfectly fine. Okay, so that's, that's the idea here behind, uh, behind Drill. And I wanna give you a quick tour now and, and look at uh, just a few kind of code snippets in terms of what, what this actually uh, uh, looks like. So this is a simple data set I downloaded from the, uh, the city of San Francisco. And what it has is all the records of crime in the last three months. So interestingly, there's a, there's a map over there on the wall that has the, the, the crime heat map for, for the city. So I didn't know that, but it's great to have a, a visual for, for this demo here. Um, and uh, what you see here is one record basically for each crime that occurred in the last three months and you know, there's, there's a time and there's a, a category, so is it a, a missing juvenile or a runaway or a rape or, or whatever it is, right? Or I guess the category's over there. So you can see the different types of uh, categories here. And so the first thing is, you know, downloading Drill to, in this case, just running it on my, uh, on my Mac. And so I tar, I downloaded the, the drill tarball onto my Mac, and I run, we have a, a, there's a shell here, we use something called SQL line, but basically it's a SQL shell, so you just launch it. This is called embedded mode, so it brings up one daemon on my Mac just for the duration of this, uh, this shell, uh, this shell's existence. And then I can run a query. So in this case, I'm running the query, and I'm counting, uh, I'm grouping on the, num on, the, on the category of the incident, and I'm counting how many of each category, right? And you can see that the way I address a table in drill, is in this case it's just a file so i can provide the path to the file so dfs just means that i'm looking at a file in this case and we'll talk more about that and this is the path to the file so sfpd incidents previous three months that's just kind of the, the name of the file when i downloaded it i'm grouping it by the, the category of the crime and then sorting by uh, how many incidents occurred and 
you know, the good news is you can see that theft is, uh, you know, more common than, uh, let's say, uh, murder or, or rape in San Francisco, right? So, um, so that's kind of the, uh, you can see how simple it is to, you know, get a, get a file, run a query, get some results on it. You know, I didn't have to set up any cluster. I didn't have to define any schema uh, information for this file. I can just go and uh, tackle it right away. And this could be a CSV, it could be JSON, it could be uh, a variety of other formats that are supported. And it's uh, also pretty easy to add formats. You, you saw that the data source is, is in the query. So you know, BFS1 is the name, we call this a storage engine instance. And this could be something that's in a file system. It could be my local file system. It could be a Hadoop file system. Um, it could be an HBase. It could be a Hive meta store, a, a, t a Hive table that exists. So we can, uh, drill can consume metadata that's in Hive. It doesn't use the Hive execution app, but it uses the, it can leverage that metadata. And then there's a notion of a workspace. This is for convenience, so you can do things like use this workspace, and then everything I do is in that kind of direct is happening inside that directory. And then finally, the table can be a path. It can be a single file. It can be a directory or a subtree, and then we query all the files inside that. It could be an HBase table. It could be a Hive table, etc. <clears throat> when you query a directory like this, so in this case we're uh, counting. Uh, the number of error messages for a given error level in some log file. Okay, so that was parquet format. And we're querying from that and grouping by error level. And in this case, I'm querying a single file, but I can also query all the log files and do an aggregate across all these files, right? So I just query, and as the table name, I specify slash app server logs, and it will look at all the files that are underneath there. Um, I can also do things like uh, uh, conditions on the directories. So there's a special variable called DERS, which is a directory, and I can, if I put a WHERE clause on that, it will know to only look inside some of the directories. So in this case, if DERS1 is greater than equal 2012, then I'm gonna look at 2012, 13, and 14, only the files under those directories. So um, that, that's also something that Drill does, and, and then in this case, it's uh, grouping by, uh, uh, by month. You can query an HBase table. You know, one of the one of the nice things here is, you know, for those who have used uh, HBase before and uh, and tried to run like a query on that, you'll know that you had to set up a defined kind of a schema inside Hive that told Hive what was inside the HBase table. Well, here you don't have to do that. If you have an HBase table, you can just go query. And you know, because of Drill's capabilities around schemaless data. Um, it's able to then just go query that table, right? So it's very simple. I, you know, in this case, it's column family dot, column family one dot month and column family one dot year. I'm selecting that from the from this table, right? And I may have something like a JSON value inside one, of, you know, just as a blob inside one of the cells inside HBase. I can use this convert from function, which basically takes this, uh, you can see, profile, right? So I'm I'm, I'm selecting profile blob uh, from the table as profile. And then I'm using that, and I can actually do operations on that as if that was part of the record. So I'm taking that JSON that was a blob, and now this the, the internal structure of that JSON is available to the query engine uh, to do all its functions, whether it's internal things or UDFs or, or things like that. Yeah. And then finally, you can also combine different data sources. So you can combine data that's inside Hive or inside the uh, HBase uh, together in a single query. So you know, here are some examples. We're joining a log directory with a JSON file, and, which has, uh, in this case, user profiles, and we're trying to identify the name and the email address for anybody that was associated with a specific error message. So we're selecting the user, user's name and their work email address, and we're joining the logs, and this is just a directory of log files, and a file, a JSON file that has all the user profiles. So you can see two different uh, formats coming from different places, and I can join those two things together using uh, using Drill. And I may have something in HBase, and then maybe a Hive table, two completely different systems, and I can join those uh, two as well. So in this case, I'm joining these two to determine the number of tweets per user. Um, so the tweets are in files inside Hive, and the users are stored inside an HBase table, and I can go uh, with a single query, and uh, I can go query that and join those two things together. So. What we'll do now is we'll have Bruce Penn, who's a solution architect at uh, MapR. He'll he'll come up and uh, demo this. Um, like I said, you can uh, 
Uh, you can download the playlist today. The current release is 0.4, so it's still early in Drill's uh, life cycle. 0.5 is coming out uh, and next week. A lot of new improvements there. You can get involved. You can contribute to the project. You can go on the mailing list and ask uh, questions, and there's a lot of people there that answer them. And then, uh, you know, if you're interested in working full time on something like this, then uh, you can join MapR and you can email me or come talk to me and, or visit you know, the company's career pages. Uh, so, again, my name is Bruce Patton, I'm a solution architect, as Tomer mentioned. Uh, I'm the sales engineering team. So, I've been with MapR about two and a half years, was at Oracle eight and a half years, uh, and then did 10 years of consulting work before that. So. I started programming in COBOL with DB2 on the mainframe, so I've been around SQL for you know, over 21 years, so it's pretty exciting to see something different from you know, an approach. Um, so you know, I'm going to paint a story as far as the demo goes, and it's how can a business analyst or a marketing analyst actually go in and, and solve a problem right, with this technology. Right, so we have a, a fictitious company called Truvail, and Truvail is a, an online retailer. They right, serve in the U.S., they're looking to grow, they want to expand throughout the world. Uh, so they have a web application and a new mobile application. Problem is their sales have been declining. So how do you expand globally if your sales are declining? So the solution is the management has set, uh, set it up so that they want a small team to get together and analyze all the data, figure it out, what's going on with sales. Can they do something proactive to fix this? Right? And the time frame they're giving them is two weeks to, to get out there, do some exploration real quickly. They don't want them to have to wait for all the data to come in after you know months of you know, modeling and whatnot, they want to get to the data as quickly as possible. And the skill sets is, on the team, which is, I'm the team today, uh, somebody with sales and marketing skills or a business analyst, they've got Tableau skills, they've got SQL skills, but they're not necessarily a coder, they're not a Java coder, they're not a, you know, somebody who can use, you know, Informatica or some of these other ETL tools that exist out there. Uh, you know, the IT overview is pretty, pretty uh, common, right, where you have you know, central IT group that's kind of managing and maintaining your hardware, your infrastructure overall, uh, and your data management and BI. So they're kind of the gatekeepers to your data sometimes, which can be a problem. Um, the data systems that were used historically at Truebell are you know, Oracle and for the online transaction processing, Mongo for the new web application, a new mobile app, um, and then Teradata as your EDW, the uh, Enterprise Data Warehouse. And if many of you probably know, one of the first use cases for Hadoop is data warehouse offload or ETL offload. Right, like why, why do all that processing on Teradata or Exadata or NetEase or whatever? Uh, why not move that over to Hadoop if you can? Way less expensive and you get, you know, it, can be much, it can be faster. It's not if you can scale. Uh, you have a lot of nodes. Um, so the data that we're first gonna move off of Teradata is the order data. So this, the, the orders or the sales and customer information, which is the order data. So that'll be in Hive. So you see some Hive tables that have customer and order. Then we also have, uh, we're moving the master data management, if you will, or the product management to HBase, which you're seeing a lot, right? A lot of people are moving their product catalog to NoSQL environments. Uh, so we'll, we'll show the products uh, data and kind of customers is up next. That'd be the, the goal of, of, the, of the group. And then also capturing clipstream data, and that data is being stored in JSON format. So the goal, of, obviously, as Tomer mentioned, you, you saw multiple different types of data stores being queried at the same time. Ultimately, that'll be the goal. Um, so, just a demonstration flow, just quickly, I want to show the, dem the integration of Drill with you know, MapR control system, that's MapR's graphical user interface to manage and monitor the cluster. It could be Umbari, it could be Cloudera Manager, it could be whatever you want to use. Um, Drill, you know, again, Apache Drill is completely 100% open source. Tomer just talked about the storage plugins or the storage engine. I'll go into that, show you how you set those up, uh, what the interface looks like, and then I'll go into what's very important is the Drill ODBC driver. So to your question, how do you get these other tools to use Drill? It's ODBC, right? Open standard, open database connectivity. The standard's been around forever. Yeah, any tool that uses ODBC can work with Drill. Or JDBC, as Tom mentioned. And then I'll talk about integration with Tableau and, and how we do that with the driver. One thing to step back, the Drill Explorer is tied in with the ODBC driver. It's a great tool to be able to take a look at all the data that you can access with Drill. So I'll show you what that looks like. It's a, it's a simple Windows interface today, and it will be met soon. Uh, and then querying JSON, HBase, and and hive separately, that kind of just happens throughout the, the demo. And then create views, so it's nice within Drill, it's really easy to create a view, so that looks like a table you know, to other different tools. To Tableau, for instance, here. But that, that, that view can be used wherever you want. So it's just, something, it's just a nice convenience you can have, you don't have to use it, but it's something that's there. And then show querying all these different data sources. One SQL query with HBase data, JSON data, and Hive data at the same time. And a little bit of analysis to kind of 
break it down to see, you know, how was, how was the campaign that they eventually recommended, how, how did that work? So actually, flip over to my uh, demo here. I was testing the speed here, it's good. <laughs> All right, so the, uh, this is map our control system. So again, this could be whatever management console you want. I have a five node cluster up on EC2, so you guys can see it's EC2. The real key here is showing that drill bits are the core. A drill bit is, a, is the service, as Tomer mentioned, that runs on every node that you want drill running on. Right, similar to you know, any other distributed databases, you generally need a, a, a Java process or you need some kind of service to run on those. You don't have to run it on every node in the cluster, you can run it on a subset, but for your best data locality, you're going to want to run it together. So this is just showcasing here that we have five of those running, so we have a drill bit on every single node. Right? Then we have obviously uh, HBase running, we have the Hive Metastore, we have Hive Server 2, MapReduce, etc. So, went along with our agenda, took care of that one. Um, and I'm actually going very fast, we don't have a lot of time, so yeah. I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions. Um, Drill also has a, a web interface for management. Uh, it's at port 8047, so when you install it, as Tomer showed you, when you install it, you know, you know, there's a zero to ten minutes, I believe it's called, to get Drill up and running. Um, you have a web interface, and this, the storage plugins or the storage engines, that's what's really key, right? So this is, gonna, this is what's going to make Drill very extensible. Right? So today we have HBase, we have Hive, you know, we have these, these two lab and tableau are just file system storage plugins. Those could be, uh, those are the kind of the same right now. I'm actually, I'll be using the tableau one for this demo. But you can have Couchbase eventually, or Mongo, or any of these other different tools can eventually be storage plugins. Right? And the goal then is you can run queries across all of them. So for HBase, it's as easy as setting it up as just, you know, tell us what the Zookeeper forum is. Or a quorum, excuse me. Uh, so if you guys are used to HBase and use something called Zookeeper and use a quorum, very easy to set up. Same with Hive. So you just give it the Hive Metastore and the port that it's running on. It's very simple there. Now what's nice here is with Hive, you can actually run queries, sorry, I need to update that. You can run queries across multiple Hive Metastores. So today most tools use only one Metastore. You can then use multiple Metastores. So again, you're just not limited, right? So you got all this flexibility. So going into the Tableau storage plugin, which is really a, a DFS or distributed file system one, you see that the type is file system. Connection is MapRFS. This could be HDFS, it could be a local file system, you know, whatever file system you want. Uh, what I'll work with today is a workspace, a couple workspaces. So as Tomer mentioned, you kind of have the, the, the storage plugin, you have the workspace, and then you have the tables within it. So you'll see that these, these clicks and views, these two works, uh, workspaces will be, will be the ones I use the most, <coughs> which is really just mounted at uh, slash map bar drill and the tableau click. So it's just a path. So we're using our NFS in this situation. We're just mounting the cluster over RFS. Uh, very simple to do. So that's what it looks like to configure some of these storage plugins. Uh, uh, one other quick one here as I scroll down here, you also see the formats that are supported today. PSV, CSV, TSV, Parquet, JSON. That's going to be, you're, we're going to be adding XML. We're going to be adding you know, all these different storage plugins for different file formats. Again, showing you the, the flexibility of Drill. All right. So. Got that one. Let's, let's look at the ODBC driver and Drill Explorer. So we have a 64-bit ODBC driver, which I have here. I have a Windows VM on my machine here that I'm running. Uh, we have 32-bit, but I obviously configured the 64-bit. So we have a Drill demo uh, ODBC driver, that, or ODBC data source. And you can connect via that Zookeeper quorum, as I mentioned, to connect to Drill, or just correct, connect directly to a Drill bit. Again, Drill bit's just a service that's running. So I just make it easy for myself. I connect it to Drill bit. Um, I test that out, my source is connected, no problem. Now what's nice here is we have this Drill Explorer button. So I'm going to keep this open. The Drill Explorer allows you to take a look at all these schemas, which is really a combination of your data source and your, uh, and your workspaces within it. So for a database, like HBase, it's going to be one of the tables within HBase right, that I have available that I can query via SQL via Drill. Right? Um, initially, when you look at this data, well, it's not very, it doesn't make a lot of sense because it's HBase, and it's got column families and whatnot, so it's a little bit hard to understand. So this word drill will allow you to drill into those column families to that given column and make sense of it. Um, Hive makes a little bit more sense for use to Hive, right? Hive is, is a truly a relational database, basically. Right? So it's easy to get that metadata. It's easy to display that metadata in your normal column or in row format. Um, what we'll be working with a lot is, as well, so now I've got HBase data, we've got relational Hive data and JSON data. So again, Drill Explorer just lets you see all of your data very easily in a simple interface. 
So again, these are this is a straight JSON file, right? So it's not embedded anywhere. Um, when I showed you HBase, by the way, there's an embedded JSON file in the column family. Um, so you can see it. Yeah, there's some some of the data I can make sense of the metadata, but other like the user info, it's nested data, right? So I've got inside the customer ID, the device, the the, the state. I have another I have another nested section called trans, uh, transaction info, which has the product ID and actually an array. So that you saw Tomer mention. You can run queries and in, in, adjust them based on the array elements. So with that, uh, one other thing real quick about it shows. So I'm, if I go into here, if I look at a, a hierarchy of a directory, I can look at, I can drill down if I'm, you know, January for 2012. That's great. I can see that data. You know, these are just some log files as well. If I want to see an aggregate, I can click on the top level of that. What that gives you the ability to do is run a query. It's basically partitioning without defining partitioning. You just define it by creating the directories. Right, so you don't have to go in, you don't have to define that metadata, it's just there based on the directory structure. So it makes it very easy to, to create a partitioning environment. And you can run queries based on those given partitions. And obviously, you don't, we only look at the data that your drill only looks at the data that you're actually querying. All right, so integration with Tableau. So if I go into Tableau, and we can actually start up Tableau here. So at Tableau, we can, I've already defined the data source, as you guys saw, the ODBC data source. Now I'm going to go ahead and, and use that data source, that ODBC data source, as my, my data source. Click on Drill, connect to that. And this is Tableau 8.2, so it's like the latest and greatest. So I can then come into Tableau and click on Schema and click on the Search button, and I now can see the same schemas that I saw in Drill Explorer, right? It's just an ODBC driver is exposing the exact same information, metadata. Uh, if I want to go into high default, for instance, I can click high default, and then click on my table name, and I say, okay, great, I got customers, I got orders, and we're going to use this information to identify what's going on with sales. So going back to that, that original use case. Uh, with Tableau 8.2, it's kind of nice. It can just tell you, hey, it's already got the same customer ID field, so it just automatically does the join. So now I come back in, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to look at order totals overall. So I'm just going to drive that to the rows. It's a little bit of a Tableau demo in here as well, um, which is great. That's the overall. I get five points from a million dollars worth of sales. That's great. It wasn't, wasn't a lot, but, uh, but now I need to see that over months, right? I want to see that over time. So I can see, obviously, at the beginning of the year, in January, data was, was low. It starts ramping up. I hit a peak in May, and then it starts going down pretty drastically. Right, so the goal here is to get October to be a lot more than September to start that upward trend again. All right, so the flip over now to you. So we showed our integration in Tableau, and I'll continue to show the integration. Just walking through, making sure everybody's on the same page here. Um, so I'm going to flip back to Drill Explorer. Sorry about that. This little guy here, and we're going to run some freehand SQL. All right, so what happens when you click on one of these tables over here, customers, for instance? What happens on the SQL tab, it just it gives me what I just did, right? So I just select from the customers. So high dash default. And we have ticks here sometimes because there's some words that are reserved words, or you may have a path. Sometimes you have to, you have to back tick. Um, and that's how you make, take care of that situation. Otherwise, sometimes you just need the data source name, the storage plugin name, basically, the workspace and the table name, right? So we got the dot notation that you're all used to in my years of programming and SQL. But I want to go in and show you some kind of neat things that you can do with, which is querying JSON directly. So I have a query here. I'm flipping over to. So my query here, what I'm doing is, if you look at the actual table I'm defining here, it's, a, it's in that workspace table clicks, and it's, a, it's called a clicks.json file. Right? So it's just a file that we define as a table. We're going to limit 100 here just because we're previewing. There's some casting that we do here, but if you look at how I access a lower level field, this T is the table, it's a file. Right. User info is top level of that nested information, and then cust ID is the actual field. Right. So in order to drill down and get to that data, that's all you got to do. It's very intuitive, it's very simple. We we'll run a query, and now that JSON data, and actually if I came over here and looked at that file, and if I look at the straight file, we got this customer ID device and state and prod. Now but if I look back at actually, oops, I have to see it changed it because I clicked on that. You'll see that now I've broken up customer ID and relational format. I flattened it out, right? So now, once you flatten it out, then you can do the joins, right? The goal here is 
you don't have to manually flatten it out before and put it in separate storage uh, environments or, or new tables, for instance. We also see the prod count field, which is really from the prod ID. I'm doing it as prod count. You'll see why it says count in a minute. Uh, is an array. So the prod ID field is an array. But there's something in, in drill as well that you can do a query using something called repeated count. So it's a function that you'll see here that I'll highlight in just a second. So you see this repeated count field right here. And now what I can do is I can say how many elements are in each of these arrays. Right? So if I hit preview on that, you'll now see that I get the product count in, in the purchase flag means, hey, somebody's searching on the web, they're clicking around, did they purchase or not? Right? So this is the whole goal of this, this capturing this JSON information is all the click, click screen data. So what are people doing? And that gives you the ability to get real-time purchases. So instead of having to wait for it to go through Oracle and go through your data warehouse and finally get to, you know, out to, <laughs> to an environment where you can query it, you can get this information very quickly. So I'm going to do something as well. As I mentioned, you can create a view. So the reason is I want to get this data. Uh, I want to get this data into um, Tableau. But actually, before I do that, I'm going to get just the first, the first product that you select. Meaning when I go to Amazon or any of the online environments, the first product I go search on is usually the one I really want initially. And I start clicking on other products. right? But the first one is generally the one you really want. So if I come back in here and we update that again. So now you'll see instead of the product count, you'll see the first product that was part of that array. right? So element zero in that array. Um, so that's great. Now I'm going to use this. And so now I will create a view. And creating a view is as easy as hitting create as. And I'm going to save it in my table of views workspace and call it click view. So it created successfully. I close that. I'm going to come back and refresh the metadata that's in the Drill Explorer, and I'll look inside of Tableau Views. So now you see Click View. I now have that view, that JSON file, is now available as a, an actual table. Right? So now I can do that in, in Tableau. I'll do the same thing with HBase, with the Products table. Um, so again, it's got an embedded JSON object there. What I'll do is I'll go back out and run a query against the HBase environment. And again, this is going directly at HBase. As Tomer mentioned, we're not going through the Hive over HBase. It's going directly at the HBase table. Oops. And we'll run that as well. So now I've just flattened out HBase. Right? So now I have a relational database there, a relational table I create as. I create another view. I create that in my tableau.views, again, workspace. So I'll call this product view. Close that, go back, refresh the metadata, click on Tableau Views, and you know, just to confirm, right? Make sure you test everything. And then now I've flattened that out. Right? So now I've got HBase data, I've got JSON data, and up in the Hive, I still have my, my customer's data, which is flattened data. So I'm going to go back into Tableau, query that data, and then we'll go in and see how our campaign went. So basically, the idea is once there's some, um, well, actually, let me jump into Tableau real quick, and I'll show you how we came up with the campaign. So let me create a new worksheet or a new workbook. How many people here use Tableau? Is there a decent amount? Okay, good. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty, pretty uh, well used these days. So again, I'm going to go connect to the ODBC database, and I'm going to, I'm going to run a different query. So as I go into the, oops, sorry, let me maximize this. So I go and I can look at the schemas again. So but instead of choosing that high dot default schema, I'm going to choose the Tableau View schema. I'm going to search on that. I'm now going to get the two views that we just created, Click View and Product View. It's going to double click on that and add it to the, the window pane here. And then I'm going to go click the Hive default, which then it's going to be my Hive tables that we've already looked at a few times, and choose Customers. So now I've got this join of three tables of three different data sources. Click view again is, is uh, JSON, customers is relational and hive, and product view is HBase. Right? Go to the worksheet, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to pull up the number of records, which is ultimately the number of clickstream records that we saw out there, and or transactions, more sessions. And right? did that session end up in a purchase or not? Right? So there's a lot more clickstream, this kind of aggregated clickstream. Um, and then what we can also do is go look at the name of the products that are within those. The goal here, our whole goal here is 
what products are people searching on? They're not buying. If we could do a campaign to push them to, to buy that product, you know, send them a, a coupon or whatever it may be, or some kind of discount, let's figure that out. Um, so within Tableau, again, I can go in, I can hit sort. I'm going to sort descendingly because what I want to see are, the, are the, the products that have been most searched on. So again, I, get, I, can, I got this nice curve. I can say, okay, great, within Tableau. Let's go and choose those top five. I'm just going to keep the five items. And now I can see, you know, pretty interesting, the Sony Notebook, because people are searching on Sony Notebook, you know, whatever, for whatever reason, apparently it's a hot item. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all the rage. Uh, but I'm also going to look at uh, device here. Oops. So I can pull up what device is on there. I also have this thing called membership. Um, so we get to see what the memberships are. So we have different types of memberships. We have gold memberships, so basically you have an infinity card, you just you rank customers based on their frequency of purchases. And you can see that very quickly that our gold members, right, are, are ones that are, are driving the search as well. So they drive the search, and they also go back to my other my other slide here, or my other report. It also shows that the, the gold members drive most of your sales. Right? So hey, let's let's try and target market the gold members who are searching at Sony. All right, let's save money in marketing dollar, you know, advertising dollars, and just and just do some deep target marketing. Uh, so now that we got that, so we now understand that. So let's go run a campaign. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add data back into the system as if it was a campaign was run. All right, so we we market it to those that team, uh, or that team, the gold members and the uh, searching at Sony. So what I'm doing here is a little uh, demo here, but I'm going to show. I've got to log into my cluster. And basically what I'm doing here, again, with my partner, you just use NFS um, to, to uh, move around the file system. I'm just copying a file. And this, this file is the clicks.campaign.json file. Probably hard for you guys to see back there. Um, but basically the idea here, I can increase that. Um, I'm, it's the clicks.campaign.json file. And I'm just copying it into that same JSON directory that we looked at before. But this now is collected web information, web logs, after the campaign was run. Right, so I'm going to copy that in there. And then the other thing I'll do is go ahead and copy in order data that was uh, collected after, as well, after the, um, after the campaign. And so I'm adding in October. You can see it's month 10, so now I have October. And we can flip back over to the, the demo. And what we can do is now we can just go ahead and do a refresh of this data. So that's now going to be pulling in that new data. And actually, one more thing I need to do here. Let me flip back to my, uh, so I pulled in that new data. But what I want, really want to do is, we now have this new campaign ID, right? Remember we have this new campaign uh, JSON file. So let's go in and let's actually run a query on, on that. And let's create a new view based on that. So now, when I run the preview, I have this new campaign ID. Was, was this transaction driven by that campaign ID, right? Driven by that campaign. This is campaign ID one today. So to make a, we're going to make a view out of this. What we're going to do is just create and replace that click view that we already had. So instead of having to, uh, so just like normal DDL that you're used to, you can just go ahead and create and replace this, this view. So it has a preview and it's created that. So it recreated that click view data. So again, let's go back into Tableau. and refresh this, so remember the click view. So now once I refresh that, the campaign ID will come back in. Now you see the campaign ID has now showed up. So I didn't have to call DBA, I didn't have to do anything to get new data brought into my Tableau environment. Right, it's very quick. And then the final piece is, well, let's make sure, let's take a look and see what happened after we added in October's data. And magically, um, magically our sales went up. Thank <laughs> you.